Good morning. And for good morning, assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to participate in uh, this inaugural uh, conference and gathering, especially at a time where uh, we're experiencing a world that is almost uh, falling apart. Uh, but it has been falling apart for quite uh, a long time. Uh, it just we have not been noticing up in the northern hemisphere. Uh, what is distinctively Special about this moment is that what was experienced in the southern hemisphere uh, has become almost uh, global uh, in relation to violence, polarization, to race and racism. And what I wanted today to, to uh, really uh, engage on a number of key concepts, one on terms of race and the centrality of race uh, that continues to uh, dominate in uh, global discourses. Wanted to also examine uh, post-coloniality and as a continuation of the colonial but without the direct physical troops uh, in there. Uh, third, I wanted to also look at one of the key elements at this particular time which is the economic uh, footprint uh, that we tend uh, almost to set aside and only think of uh, uh, elements of identity, especially at this particular time where the rising tide of Islamophobia and the focus on the Muslim other as a threat to uh, civilization. And then we'll conclude about uh, possibly a discussion about the clash of civilization or as it was Saeed called it the clash of ignorance uh, as it needs to be uh, defined. Now in the 18th and 19th century, uh, century early, uh, parts of the, and parts of the 20th century, the idea of a human zoo uh, was an established normative way uh, to come into di direct contact and, ex and examine up close the lower breeds on the human evolutionary scale. Uh, so we actually had the experience of a human zoo. Uh, and this human zoo was a way to get in contact with, uh, in general, uh, human beings that don't belong to the uh, refined or the pure race. Human zoos of this type were present in major European cities and frequented by everyone in society, society since it provided a window into the past, the uncivilized and distant animal-like types who are still present in distant places and are yet to emerge into full humanness, but their emergence into full humanness had to be done through discovery. And this gets us into this notion of discovery and contact with uh, with the lesser human beings. Now one can argue that the discovery of the Americas, and I think Ramon is going to speak about this link between the discovery or the notion of discovery of the Americas and the emergence of the modern. Uh, and I will leave that possibly in the afternoon where he would engage in it. From a periodization perspective, the human zoo corresponded to Europe's colonial efforts and the need to situate a realm of the subhuman, uncivilized, that necessitates intervention, conquest, development project, and civilizational trajectory. European citizens were mobilized to imagine, theorize, and internalize a civilizing slash Christianizing role for themselves across the world. Consequently, the, the human zoo was an ideological construct, made it possible for Europeans to witness firsthand the inferiority and then to be inspired into civilizational missions and actions across the globe. Importantly, racial superiority exists. Importantly, racial superiority exists if an inferior is present or imagined to measure the constructed qualitative and quantitative difference through it and by it. Meaning, in order for a superior to exist, there must be by necessity and epistemic presence of an inferior. So as such, this discourse of exploring and finding uh, the inferior races was part and parcel of constructing the superior. A superior has, mean, has meaning only on the presence of inferior, and it does not exist then 
if it does not exist, then it has to be produced. Otherwise, superiority has no meaning to it. The zoo and the inferior humans brought to populate the exhibits were part and parcel of Europe's crafting a superior self in relations to the exhibited other. Identify, identify formation and affirming global white supremacy. Therefore, we have to begin to assert the presence of white supremacy and racism as founded upon white supremacy. And in, increasingly in the US, uh, this attempt to uh, theorize and continue to exist to engage with white supremacy, not only in the domestic, but with the global, is a very important uh, aspect that has to be engaged. And I think uh, Fanon was one of the early individuals actually to write about uh, the concept of race and concept of white supremacy. And I think also Dubois was a major theor uh, theoretician on uh, this question and the impact also on the individual who is otherized through uh, this process. The subhumanists were described to that non-European population before Europe came into contact with them. And theories of inferiority were all well developed and expounded upon before, before sailing out to discover, pillage, and conquer. Certainly race is socially construct, constructed phenomena, but this does not mean that it has no vested meaning, power, or impact on the racialized subjects themselves and those who undertake the classification process. The human zoo made it possible to establish an initial location for the inferior races within the European mental landscape, which was always the other, the subhuman, and constantly in need of civilizational and interventionist projects. Now, I would argue that race continues to be the focal point of relationship between European societies and non-European societies where the racialization of the other, the inferiorization of the other, is contingent on shaping the discourse and formulating policies, both in the domestic, in a sense, the global south living in the north, and the global north that is visiting, engaging in development, and engaging in intervention in the global south. Now let me shift a little bit right now to speak about the colonial, post-colonial. At the start of the 20th century, almost 75% of the world land surface was subject to either direct colonial colonization or some sort of protected status. Africa and Asia were the private dominion of colonial powers. With millions living and existing under the boots of pernicious colonial control, relegating them to servitude, bondage, bondage and treated as mere beasts of burden. At the time, a traveler would take a journey from Africa's north to the south, then east to west, he would find that all the territories were colonial possessions of the French, British, Dutch, Portuguese, German, Italian, and Spanish, with only few areas experiencing any type of independence, self-determination, or freedom. Movement of raw materials, rendering services, and cheap labor was the task assigned to populations in the colonies by European powers. The pillaging of the southern hemisphere was systematic, structured, and total, and total, leaving nothing untouched in the process, human, rocks, or trees. As the world commemorates the 100th year anniversary of World War I, including here in France, we must be reminded of hundreds of thousands of troops recruited from the colonies to fight imperial wars and sacrifice themselves to protect and defend one European colonial power from another. This, while the colonial subject was not equal to a European, or in, the, or in reality not even considered full human being in this period. The colonized subject was used as a fighting force at the same time brought to inhibit the human zoos spoken above spaces within the European capitals to be publicly gazed upon and touched as uncivilized and subhuman. The end of World War I did not bring peace to the global south or end the colonial project itself. Rather, it was granted further leg legitimacy under the newly formed League of Nations and the, and the paternalistically crafted mandate powers. As a matter of fact, the colonial footprint was expanded and incorporated a vast swath of lands in the Arab world 
to French and British possessions. If we remember the Sykes-Picot agreement at uh, the end of First World War, rather than end uh, colonial control, actually expanded colonial control, and much of the Arab uh, and Muslim world uh, was transformed into French and British possessions. And today, as we gaze at Iraq and see the consequences of what's occurring in Iraq, in Syria, and even pre that, in terms of Kuwait and the conflict between Kuwait and Iraq, much of the conflicts actually rests at the end of the First World War and the crafting of the sykes picot Agreement. The region, the region namely, currently named the Middle East, was born, borders drawn, and also we could include the Palestinian dispossession was facilitated by the colonial powers during this period. Likewise, Africa and Asia witnessed further entrenchment of the colonial project and forced, forced a voluntary movement of populations across the globe, as well as intense demand for raw materials and labor to, build, to rebuild Europe. One way to view the dispossession of the Palestinians in this, in this way is to think of it, of it is as a process of forced removal of Jews from Europe and Arabs from Palestine, which was facilitated by colonial logic and strategic planning. The forced removal of Jews from Europe coming on the heels of an intense period of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, England and France itself with the Dreyfus Affair, being a paradigmatic representation of the time and making of Zionism logic solution to escape the continent intensification of the otherization, bigotry, and racism directed at the Jews. England on its part and other European powers acted purely from a strategic and racist consideration in supporting the creation of a Jewish state. On the one hand, as a buffer to protect British colonial possessions in Egypt and trade routes, and on the other, removing the undesirable Jews from Europe. In this context, the dislocation of both Jews and Palestinians and setting them on a clash course against one another to serve a larger colonial project is at the heart of what's set up in the newly colonized region. We often don't critique the fact that the Palestine-Israel conflict of today itself is a European colonial project that sets the Arab and Jews on a course of conflict to serve a larger colonial project in itself. The Second World War also witnessed similar and unjust as massive forceful movement of human beings, which, measured, which featured the Holocaust as the final solution to Europe's permanent and persistent other, the Jew. As such, the Holocaust represents a European norm if one locates the centrality of racism directed at Jews for being Jews, and going back even to the period before the expulsion and the Inquisition. The actual war, war effort, including moving colonial subjects from the colonies and into the battlefields to fight and defend European powers from each other, with hundreds of thousands dying a nameless and faceless death, since they belong to the realm of non-being and the subhuman. The movement continued after the war ended, as many from the global south were brought into the north to rebuild destroyed cities and economies while having to contend with constant otherization, racism, and xenophobia. So in here, once again, thinking of this movement and I, as the debate here in Europe is shaping around refugees and immigration, uh, these processes started much earlier than uh, our current period. And I will also show that the economic this location post Second World War, and especially in the 1970s, continued to disrupt the economies of the global south and foment a clash of civilization as a means of control. So these are uh, ways and mechanisms to maintain and extend the control process in the global south. The anti-colonial struggles uh, of the 1960s, 1950s and 1960s the anti-colonial liberation struggle took shape in the late 50s and throughout the 1960s with most of the countries in the global south gaining the right to political self-rule, but not economic and underlying or epistemic self-determination and independence. So let me repeat this. Most of the countries in the global south gaining the right to political self-rule, but not economic, or epistemic self-determination and independence. The world as we know it, then and now, is a Eurocentric world. Our experiences of the world is Eurocentric. 
The definition of what a human is is Eurocentric, and our projection of the world likewise is Eurocentric. Cert <coughs> certainly, the new countries declared independence had a, a new flag, national stamp, ruling assemblies, and all the trappings of imagined power. But the economy and the resources remained in colonial hands or in the hands of the carefully selected and nurtured elites who acted as middlemen and managers of the colonial subcontract. In this regard, the newly minted post-colonial independent, independent states acted more like a franchise when it came to economic and wealth distributions. The colonial powers left behind a whole set of constraints and control, control levers that were intended to keep the raw materials flowing northward while continuing, continuing to find ways to expand the level, the level of structured, uh, structural dependency. Now I wanted here just to uh, have a note that our understanding of international law the codification of international law is codification of colonial power disparities into the structures of international law, in particular economic rights in the global south. And no better example to think of this uh, codification than to think of the contracts that were given in Iraq post-US invasion. The victors, or those who were involved in the U.S. invasion of Iraq did it up the rise of Iraq's resources, phone, uh, phone <coughs> rights or phone system rights, access to the market before actually the invasion took place. And as you remember, because France did not participate, France was pushed out from actually having any contracts. Similarly, this, the period of colonial discourse cemented this international right or international law right relative to the global south. We could debate this, but I think at the core level of it is codification into law, the colonial uh, uh, structure, and making it permanent by means of legalities. The 1970s old crisis created much bigger and deeper economic problems for the post-colonial and newly independent states. By unleashing a massive global inflation crisis that devalued currency, raw materials, and other segments of the economy. In addition, the rising cost of oil made it possible to carry on normal economic activities and cause governments to increase or institute massive subsidies for fuel, electricity, food commodities, healthcare, and education. While some of these subsidies existed prior to the oil crisis, Nevertheless, the level of price support and, ex and government's expenditures increased so as to keep the lead on possible protests and also to prevent internal political opposition from exploiting the economic weakness to push, to push for radical revolutionary change in the global south. Aside and a critical effect of the petrodollar phenomena is the role played by banking institutions in the global, in the global north in fomenting the global debt crisis as a way to unload the massive liquidity deposited by oil producing countries and petroleum companies and made its way into their vaults by the billions. As oil prices shot up and with its massive increase in deposit coming from oil producing countries, the banking institutions were facing major crises with needing to pay out more interest on deposit with no end in sight. Banks make, money when they, banks make money when they sell loans and have others pay the interest to the bank, rather than the other way around. When you deposit your money into your account, the banks enter it as a liability on their books, and it can be changed into an asset once it's loaned out to others, and many times over, then it can, uh, then it can serve the purpose as an asset. The banking industry went into overdrive and set in motion one of the most aggressive global loan sales act initiatives to unload billions of deposits and transform them into revenue generating schemes. The post-colonial third world, using third world here metaphorically, was a primary target for unloading these deposits. Loading up the newly independent post-colonial states with billions of dollars worth of debt meant achieving deeper levels of economic control coupled with already corrupted elites, made for the dismantling of any prospects for freedom, 
dignity, and a future with fair and just economic opportunities. Debt salesmen, debt salespersons were sent across the globe, south, global south, to search for loan opportunities and to look for funding big ticket items and projects that can unload massive amounts of petrodollars in the quickest way possible. No attention was paid to the viability of the funded project or whether the country had even the capacity to undertake such projects, since the sole driving force behind all of it was to unload the cash and make it someone else's responsibility to, go for, to pay for the interest. The colonized elites were overjoyed with the flood of cash coming their way and were more than happy to play along since it meant a bigger and fatter commission or at times outright stealing of all but few dollars spent on decorative and ceremonial projects. Often the same banks that made the loans in the first place assisted these colonized elites to funnel the money back into secret accounts in Swiss, French or British or other global north financial institutions while taking a cut for, the, for services rendered. Now this gets me to this constant uh, claim that uh, the global south is corrupt. And certainly there is corruption in the global south. For example, in this yearly uh, uh, list of countries that are most corrupt, often they put Nigeria as the most corrupt. Sometimes they replace it with another country, uh, replace it with another country. But this is once again is using a racialized structure as a means of control. Uh, just think about the 2008 economic collapse. In the United States and also in Europe, in, in Europe the financial structure was so vested in corruption that the corruption in the global south collectively can't account for one day of corruption that is handled by Wall Street or some of the major institutions. For example, you could look at uh, poor Mobutu in Zaire. Uh, for 30 years, he managed to accumulate almost $5 billion in his Swiss bank account. And we say in New York, that's what's done almost on, over lunch, that we actually take $5 billion from one group of people to the other with a swift financial uh, transaction that takes place. But this tends to give the projection that the other is incapable, that is constantly needing intervention, economic and otherwise, and in here racialized inferiority is also projected in economic terms, and thus we constantly project and put these lists of countries that are most corrupt, while not asking the question, if Mobutu was corrupt, which countries facilitated the transfer of his funds to Western banks? Assuming that he did not have the whole economic structure, he did not control the banks that had the transactions, he did not manage the IMF, the World Bank, nor was he carrying uh, his own funds into many of these Western institutions. More importantly, as you know, if you cheated on your taxes in the US or in Europe, the government will come after you even if it's a matter of hundreds of dollars or hundreds of euros. Now, here is a country with a, its leader funneling $5 billion to Swiss bank account and nobody knows about it and nobody facilitated it and we only list it as the country that has most corruption. So these are what you call the mechanism by which we otherwise and create a racial epistemic even in economic, in economic terms. Now the, the recently independent post-colonial state lost all control and were placed under direct receivership of the global north financial system. The strategy called for sending to the north none other than the IMF and the World Bank. I call them the bouncers and economic enforcers for the global financial system, who made sure that the debt was being paid while all other internal services and subsidies were cut to the bone. The IMF and World Bank acted to protect the global north, banking interests, and the expense of the post-colonial south. The IMF mandated structural adjustment policies, which were the tools utilized in the post-colonial period to achieve maximum dependency and control over economies of the global south. Having sold loans to, to the impoverished countries, facilitated wealth transfers, for the elites who signed the documents, the banking industry then sent its well-dressed henchmen and global bouncers, the IMF and the World Bank, to break the metaphorical legs 
of the population and extract payments by any means necessary. The structural adjustment programs called for increased export of raw materials to bring hard currency to pay for the debt, liberalize and privatize the economy, reduce or totally remove government regulations that prevent foreign control, that prevent foreign control or ownership of assets, currency devaluation while recommending connecting it to the dollar or euro, encourage foreign investment in mine, raw materials, agribusiness and tourism, and topping it off by cutting government support for education, healthcare, price support for food stables like wheat, corn, rice and beans, and social services. These adjustment policies collectively work to further ruin what was little left of the ability of post-colonial populations to sustain a livelihood and a dignified life. The increased export of raw materials by the Global South created a flood of commodities in the market, thus collapsing prices and reducing the hope for foreign currency return. Such a policy recommendation was intended to help the Global North and reduce raw material costs for the manufacturing base while increasing the rate of exports directed to post-colonial South. Furthermore, the privatization and liberalization policies made it possible for the multinational corporation to devour what little was left of the outside of the control, uh, was whatever, uh, what little was left outside of their control and managed to buy out and disrupt any small and incipient economic base uh, in the global south. These, these plans should be correctly named destructive adjustment programs destructive adjustment programs that managed to reassert a deeper colonial control in post-colonial period, which likewise resulted in another massive wave of immigration, refugees, and dislocation from the South. And instead of reducing dependency, the IMF and World Bank deepened the crisis and effectively became the real power in countries that were under these adjustment programs. Dependency on the global north affected every part of the economy with sole focus directed at paying the debt and enabling the global banking institutions to transfer wealth, wealth, wealth again from the global south to the global north. What started during the colonial period which reached its pinnacle in these adjustment programs as post-colonial independent countries were tasked with implementing sweeping policies that again delivered the country's economy and society to the ex-colonial motherland without any questions asked. Again, the colonially trained elites, and this is in, in terms of often we focus about the elites and the discussions about the elites. Uh, one aspect that we need to at least understand, all the ex-colonial elites were trained in the global north. All the post-colonial elites are trained in the global north, whether it's Sorbonne, Oxford, uh, Harvard, Yale, you name it. And therefore, they were sent to manage the post-colonial for the benefit of the ex-colonial motherland. Again, the colonially trained elites were in bed during the whole process and got paid handsomely by getting the country into debt, managing the privatization and using might and power to keep the population in line. Protests and popular mobilization in the South were expected and prepared for jointly with the IMF and World Bank as a way to break, the, to break the backbone of any government or movement that might challenge or alter their recommended policies. The corrupted, colonially nurtured and paid for elites deployed maximum force and power to crush the opposition, which was part of the policy and not unplanned for anomaly in the implementation phase. So let me repeat this. The colonially nurtured and paid for elites deployed maximum force and power to crush opposition, which was part of the policy and not an unplanned anomaly in the implementation phase. For example, often we think about Mubarak and his uh, crackdown or some of the dictators that we have engaged with, and we think of their crackdown against movement as a response to, rather than a pre-planned uh, undertaking, as a way to actually increase control and uh, foment almost depreciation of the assets that are present within the global, uh, uh, with the global uh, South. 
The protests and violence were used to extract even deeper concessions from the elites and then committing whatever remaining resources to bolster the military, which was supplied, trained, and designed to protect the global North economic interests at the expense of the population in the South. Another departure. If the question today is stopping the violence in the global South, which is a desirable outcome, then let's stop selling weapons to the global South that does not produce its weapons. The United States is the number one producer of uh, weapons of mass destruction. Our, the US economy is a military industrial economy. Uh, French economy has a very high rate of dependence on military sales, same as England and many of the Northern Hemisphere. So if, for example, the discussion is about Iraq and ISIL, which should be a discussion, uh, who supplied them with weapons? How can a group that does not produce its weapon can wreak havoc in a way that it does? Who's supplying them with all these infrastructures? And as such, those questions have to be asked uh, before we project that the problem is only with the violence and not the structural violence that comes behind the violence, uh, be, be, behind the violence itself. Employing maximum violence, targeted assassination, the drones attacks and sending, and sending activists and intellectuals to exile crushed the opposition and enabled the Global North corporations and financial institutions to purchase, to purchase further assets at an even much lower and discounted prices than the market value for these assets. The bankers and colonial motherland policymakers came up with even more insidious plans to shake the pockets of the post-colonial South by introducing what is known as debt for equity, debt for equity swap framework. Debt for equity swap amounted to one of the most sophisticated and quote, civilized international thievery produced, directed, and acted on the world stage by faceless and nameless suits and ties sitting in offices and country clubs in the global north. Once again, debt for equity swaps. It should be called death for equity swap for it squeezed the last drops of hope and life out of populations by robbing them of their property during daylight hours on national TV and for all to watch. Each country that owed money and was indebted to the banks because of loans taken and signed by the presidents, ministers, and elites in the global south was forced to surrender its assets. The debt for equity swap deals were worked out and planned by governments and banks in the, in the north whereby states in the South had to give up their gold mines, rainforests, natural resources, water and telephone companies, and vast agricultural lands to pay back for the bad and unperforming loans that were taken under the uh, direct supervision of the global north. The debt for equity swap was a death nail if any was needed to completely recolonize the global South. But in this case, the focus was on tangible and fixed assets without having to deal with anything else. The earlier colonial period, the colonial troops had to be on the ground, military equipment, running prisons, administration, etc. But the more new revolutionary and improved colonial project in the post-colonial structure removed any costs for control and domination and shifted it to the local managers who are paid a contractual fee to oppress and sell their country and soul to corporations and banks in the global north and to the ex-colonial motherlands. Post-colonial states and the global financial structure made it possible for the global south, for the global south to actualize, to actually subsidize its own dispossession. Uh, as ownership of the assets is moving to the global north, then all internal economic activities became even more regulated by the needs and demands of multinational, multinational corporations. Now I'm going to conclude with the focus on the clash of civilization piece in order for us just to get uh, this, this uh, thesis around. Now the clash of civilization thesis, as many of us uh, have come to understand it, was put forth by Samuel Huntington uh, in the United States. Now, Samuel Huntington uh, was responding to uh, a thesis of Fukuyama on what is called the end of history, as the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of East-West uh, confrontation. Uh, Huntington came with the thesis that uh, in the current period, there's an end 
uh, of uh, ideologically driven uh, confrontation and the world is entering a new phase in the wake of the end of the Cold War. He said that the fundamental source of conflict in this new world will not be primarily ideological or primarily economic. The great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Now in here for me, some Samuel Huntington thesis is actually using or reintroducing a racial view by using culture as a signpost for racial difference. Where, race, where racism, scientific racism, was discredited by the end of the Second World War with the, with the complete and total defeat of Nazism, and also the emergence of the civil rights movement in the United States and also uh, parts of Europe, and then the anti-colonial struggles have discredited the notion of scientific racism. So cultural racism becomes the signpost where the same cultural differences or the same differences that were articulated in relations to race gets to be introduced in relations to this clash of civilization, clash of civilization rhetoric. Huntington argues that in the wake of the Cold War, the main pattern of global conflict would probably be cultural, not economic or ideological. He says in the, com in the coming year, the local conflicts most likely to escalate into major wars will be those along the fault lines between civilizations. And he listed eight major civilizations, Western, Confucian, Confucius, Japanese, Islamic, Hindu, Slavic, Orthodox, Latin American, and African. Now, I don't need to go and uh, critique the framing of this uh, by putting African. Uh, once again, this is a racist notion. We, when we think of Africa as one country, undifferentiated from North Africa to South Africa, East to West, Sub-Saharan Africa, is undifferentiated and just shows the high level of ignorance, structural ignorance in relations to Huntington. But what Huntington actually uh, focuses is that, that the key uh, point of conflict will be with the emerging Sino-Islamic alliance that the Sino-Islamic alliance will be the most pressing threat that will face the, uh, the uh, Western world. Uh, what is interesting in here is that as the rising power of China, economic power of China, is projecting the Chinese, uh, the fear of China, which has a long-standing in US discourse about the yellow peril and so on, and shifting it to have an alliance, so combining the red Chinese color with the uh, Muslim green color and constructing conveniently two locations of a Western uh, fear and prejudice and using that as a way to speak about the clash of civilization. The, the events of 9-11 uh, in the United States brought the Islamic civilization to the focus of the United States and much of the influences on George Bush's White House during the build-up to the Gulf War actually came from participants in believing or, uh, in, uh, or internalizing the clash of civilization uh, thesis, whether it's uh, uh, Bernard Lewis, uh, Fuad Ajami, and others who were actually coming and going on a constant basis to the Pentagon and to the White House giving talks and lectures about the uh, clash of civilization. Uh, now, Huntington goes on to detail the various periods of, of conflict, but I know my time is, is coming to up, so let me conclude with the following. That the thesis of the clash of civilization that is being asserted, it's a one way or one new method of continuation of the colonial in the post-colonial and shaping relations based on racial difference by articulating it into a clash of civilization and clash of, uh, and clash of cultures. Uh, what is the focus in current period on the migration and the mass change that are taking place based on fear of demographics uh, that is uh, centered both in Europe and the United States is being articulated around racial difference and cultural difference rather than seeing this as a result of 100 years of failure if you want to say failures of plans, the collapse of the post-colonial structure, and as a result of the collapse of the post-colonial structure, we have a mass movement of population that increasingly is unsustainable in the global, uh, in the global uh, south. A clear example, just to depart from the Muslim part of the problem, is to look at Mexico and Latin America. 
through the neoliberal economics and the uh, free trade agreements that resulted in massive displacement of uh, peasants and, uh, farm and farmers, their displacement as a result of the neoliberal economics privatization caused a massive influx of immigrants up to the north into the United States. They are spoken of in the same way as constituting a clash of civilization, especially Huntington's second book, Who We Are, said that the biggest threat that faces America is actually the Latino population. And here the Latino population for the most part are Christian, are Catholic, and therefore they are not Muslim. So if you're in the United States and you follow the debate of Trump and others in relation to immigration, Immigration in the United States does not have a Muslim face or its name Muhammad or Ali, but rather it's Hussein. It's having a Spanish face to it, and it's being projected once again in a clash of civilization based on a particular racialization of the Latino population. So we need to begin to take a global perspective on how the post-colonial is being maintained and extended in the current period. And I think the racial epistemic is still one of the most important categories that we need to deal with and contend in the formulations of these relations. Thank you, and hopefully I did not go over time in this period. Thanks.